It is a tremendous honor to welcome Professor James Cobb to this podcast. He is the Professor of History Emeritus at the University of Georgia, and we're discussing his new biography of the great historian C. Van Woodward on this show. Uh, it is titled C. Van Woodward, America's Historian. Jim, welcome to the show. Ah, thank you. It's uh, great of you to invite me. I'm delighted. So uh, I'd like to begin by asking you, um, so of all the nominees for the title of America's his Historian, I suppose there's Arthur Schlesinger or Richard Hofstetter, amongst mm -hmm. others. Why do you believe that uh, Woodward deserves this honorific? Well, um, yeah, I didn't, you know, the, the kind of rule of thumb for people who, uh, well, I think people who write anything, but, but certainly history is, you know, you, you, you never quite realize what it was you wanted to say or how you wanted to say it until it's too late to change it. And uh, I, I think I didn't do a good enough job of, of explaining in the text uh, what, the, you know, the basis for the, for the title. But um, I, uh, in, in, in making the case for Woodward, and certainly the case could be made for Hofstadter or, or you know, any number of, uh, of, of other Historian, my my case for um, for Woodward as uh, as you know America's historian um, rests in part on the fact that uh, he was so successful in shaping uh, the the views of not just the uh, history of the South but the history of the United States uh, as as both uh, an academic and uh, as a a a, a, right, a public intellectual, uh, whereas I mean Schlesinger, you know, he was widely known. He he he, you know, he got his celebrity with the the emergence of the of the Kennedy family, and uh, and he was you know he's a brilliant man. Uh, but he he wrote uh, uh, history. Uh, you know, he he wrote his approach to history was was I think. Uh, somewhat more uh, constricted in Woodward's in the sense of, of <clears throat> you know, examining specific aspects of American policy or, or American politics, whereas Woodward was, I think, a much more open-ended uh, uh, historian, and um, he, uh, you know, he had his influence in the academy through through what he wrote, uh, you know, which was read by, by you know thousands of his fellow scholars, uh, as well as the people he trained, who went on and so you know built on what they had learned from Woodward to to uh, kind of extend or revise his influence in the academic community. But his uh, but his move into the public realm as a historically informed uh, uh, commentator. Uh, led him to address a, a great many aspects of American history, and and I would I would argue that the more you can actually, when you look at his books, the progression of his academic books, starting with his biography of Tom Watson in 1938, and moving on through his origins of the New South, and and um, um, his study of the uh, reunion and reaction to study of the redeemers and the, the end of reconstruction and then uh, his strange career of Jim Crow that he is progressively integrating the broader context of American history into those books so that that he's he's really commenting on you know in in reunion and reaction for example he's he's coming on the state of national, politics uh every bit as much as even even more so i would say than than uh, southern politics uh, so uh i think he reaches the 1950s and when he completes uh, the strange career of jim crow in 1955 um by that point he is you know his his he has expanded his his focus and his uh and his his analytic approach, I think, to to look at, at issues of, of national concern, and uh, he, you know, ironically enough, he he uses what he 
has come to understand and and uh, at least believe about the South uh, to 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 sort of. Uh, um, uh, serve him as a lens on the American national character, and and so in his in his probably his most influential essays in a book called The Burden of Southern History, which was really <laughs> it really showed Southern history to be more of an asset to to Southerners if they would approach it properly than a burden. But but he's basically saying that that you know American history. Uh, uh, Americans, uh, American national identity is based on America's history, just as Southern regional identity is based on its regional history. And that, um, you know, the, the difference is that, you know, the South's experience with, with defeat and military occupation and, and grinding poverty, um, is um, uh, along with failure, which is just, you know, that was not even in the lexicon of, of uh, you know, a, a na a nationalist American historians of that day, uh, that uh, it, it, it really gave the South a standing in the global community in a way that was relevant to, to you know, you could look to any, you could look to Europe, you could look to Asia, you could look anywhere, and you could see these, these, uh, Threads, these common threads, whereas in the nas in the um, national narrative of American history, there was no place for them. There was no place for failure. There was no place for for deprivation, uh, you know, or or uh, humiliation. It was all one continuous victory narrative, and uh, and Wood was basically saying that that um, uh, Americans and their historians. Had misread this narrative as as if it imputed some particular. So we can so. Um, the um, essentially he was saying that that uh, you know the triumphal narrative of American history uh, had uh, they the, the historians had, and of course they and um, not just historians but other you know. Political commentators and uh, uh, had 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 sort of taken the the United States record of of winning every conflict, uh, you know, uh, making economic progress, uh, you know, expanding its, its uh, prosperity to greater and greater numbers of of the citizens. That they'd taken all of this to sort of make. Um, make it seem that that America was invincible, that um, you know it, its superior virtue and knowledge and um, energy um, guaranteed success uh, in any venture that it undertook. And you know this was uh, when he, he's writing this in the 1950s is particularly uh, uh, prescient because the United States is just. Uh, Moving toward uh, its involvement in Southeast uh, uh, Asia, more uh, its direct you know, physical involvement in Southeast Asia, and which he would later you know, write about in in other uh, other contexts. But but so he was he was mindful his 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 progression of thinking about the South. I think made him more mindful of of what. Uh, American history was all about and what it really should have told uh, Americans rather than the message that was being imparted by, you know, the historians of the day, as well as the politicians. So, um, so even as, as a, you know, so-called Southern historian, I think he, by, you know, by, by the 1950s, he's, he really, and, and after that, his writing, um, you know, his most important in, influential writing uh, was it was on at least on that. I mean, the civil rights movement is is by then a national uh, issue rather than something that's totally confined to the concerns in the South. And uh, and he's he's involved. He's writing about you know, he's writing about the Vietnam involvement. He's writing about our our whole anti-communist policy of, uh, you know, and trying to to sort of shove uh, uh, America's way of life, so to speak, uh, down the throats of, of other countries and 
and societies. And so he has, uh, you know, he has, he has really broadened his scope as a, as a commentator uh, to, to become, you know, at least as much a commentator on American history uh, and in American life as Southern history and Southern life. And then, you know, his, his involved, he was involved in this, in the national experience, which was, to my view, probably one of the most successful American history textbooks ever. And uh, very influential. His co-authors included Arthur Schlesinger and Richard Hofstadter. But Woodward's part of that, that, that sort of dealt with the, uh, you know, put together the pieces of how the United States came out of the Civil War and progress toward economic modernity was uh, was I think you know it was just a centerpiece of of the whole uh, uh, volume and certainly the the second half of uh, of the of the textbook dealing with the period since the Civil War. So um, you know he was he was definitely uh, more a lot more than a Southern historian and. Uh, I think, uh, you know, his, a lot of what, even the way he approached the South, his techniques uh, wound up being adopted by people who were studying topics apart from the South. <laughs> now, one thing I'm quite curious about is that, according to Woodward, as well as yourself, do you believe that the South, the American South, the modern American South, to be more exact, is a product of uh post-Civil War Reconstruction era, or is there a Southern identity that existed uh, pre-Civil War? Well, I, you know, I don't, I've, I've written about this uh, more directly in, in an earlier book called A Way Down South, which is a history of Southern identity. And, um, you know, my argument there is, is you know, and we're, we're here, we're talking about white people because, you know, the black people are enslaved at the, prior to the Civil War, but uh, that uh, the, the sense of, of the South or a South uh, was, was really pretty late in coming that, that uh, it was not really until the conflict with the North uh, centered on the issue of the expansion of slavery, that that the Southern states began to think in terms of of you know their commonalities with with you know the the, the adjacent states, uh, and um, I think it was hard you know the 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 idea that that you know suddenly you know you've created this confederacy and and you know trying to instill. Uh, nationalism with respect to the the Confederacy, which was this you know just sort of uh, quickly constructed uh, union of the of the Southern states, uh, it proved to be very difficult because and you know you could uh, again and again if you look at the, the Southern soldiers going to fight in the Civil War, you know they they made it very clear they were going to fight for you know South Carolina or. Their their hometown in South Carolina or Georgia, uh, you know, they they weren't thinking in terms of standing beside. I mean, they weren't thinking when they left to fight. Uh, they were thinking that more more so by the end of the war that they were standing, you know, beside their their comrades from Virginia or or you know the uh, you know, the Carolinas or or, or or wherever. I think the that that conflict. Uh, and the, the, the sense of, of fighting alongside each other really created uh, a, a a sense of Southern identity they, that that hadn't truly been there uh, a decade earlier. <laughs> so, and and, it, and this survives, of course, uh, you know, in, in the postbellum period. <laughs> So to what extent was the lost cause narrative uh, popular during the Reconstruction era? And what did Woodward make of it? Well, Woodward, um, you know, that's in the, uh, the, the, the lost cause narrative. I mean, they, it, it took them just a bit to kind of bring that all together. I mean, the right, right, you know, very soon after the, uh, after the war was over, uh, you know, former Confederate leaders like Jefferson Davis set about you know, creating a, a you know a collection of materials and a, a you know an organization called the Southern Historical Society that was supposed to basically make the 
South's case for, for what it had done historically. And um, with, uh, you know, that became kind of the foundation stone for the more romanticized version of, of the of the lost cause uh, where uh, when, when, you know, literary figures, uh, for example, began moving in to kind of capitalize on this, this attempt to kind of rally Southerners to their own version of their past uh, that, that you sort of get, you know, it, it, the, the appeal of the, of the lost cause spreads and it becomes, uh, you know, becomes like a litmus test of a, of your Southern loyalty, if you, you know, if you don't ascribe to the, uh, to the lost cause. And, uh, but Woodward, um, and Woodward himself, strangely, uh, uh, although he, he despised people who he, he saw manipulating this faith in the lost cause to ends that he believed were contrary to what the Confederates had actually fought for. Uh, but at the same time, you know, he he uh, he was not he was not entirely immune to the idea of these uh, uh, you know benign aristocratic Southern planters uh, who uh, you know who who responded to what they saw as a threat to their way of life and uh, you know though outnumbered uh, you know fought valiantly and and uh, and and you know proved themselves and uh, acquitted themselves quite well. Um, and his early work, especially, he he shows a great deal of reverence for men like like uh, Alexander Stevens or Robert Toombs or uh, you know uh, Charles Colcock Jones, who were who were uh, who were the progenitors uh, of political progenitors of the Lost Cause uh, uh, by the uh, by the end of the nineteenth century. So, um, so, but it was a force that. It was it was a, a kind of rallying force that uh, you know when when it, it, you, you you believe in the lost cause you must preserve its ideals and so uh, that was easily tapped into to say uh, you know we must make sure we restore white supremacy put black people back in their place in so far as we possibly can and um, by by you know passing segregation laws by taking the vote away from them this became this became like a you know if you if you weren't for that then you know you're not really on board with the the ideals of the lost cause and and so it became uh, it was far from a harmless myth and uh, and and it's it's no uh, coincidence that that they began all this statue building to to you know confederate heroes or confederate fighting men uh, at the same time that the states were moving toward taking the vote away from black people and, and setting them apart socially through segregation. Now, I I do read that there's a lot of um, Southern discontent, even contemporary, uh, towards Abraham Lincoln. Um, there's a narrative that goes that Lincoln is uh, well, the progenitor of a big national government and he doesn't respect states' rights and he waged an unnecessary war against the South and then would later culminate into an invasion and annexation of the Southern states. Um, so I wonder if uh, Woodward himself uh, anticipates this narrative and also what he thought of Lincoln in general. Well, I think he was a great admirer of, um, of Lincoln. He, he, you know, Woodward was, but he was, you know, he was in Arkansas. He was born and raised in Arkansas, and he, you know, he he felt regional loyalties, and so he did not like the, the ways in which, in during Reconstruction and in the aftermath of the Reconstruction, that that um, you know, white white Southerners were kind of singled out for he thought for uh, you know. Persecution, or or at least uh, singled out to be, to be kind of neutralized politically, uh, and uh, he uh, and he understood, and he, he definitely did not like the what had happened to the concentration of economic power 
uh, in the North during as during the war, which of course was not. I mean, you know, Lincoln was a Whig. He he, he had some nationalist ideas, and he believed in you know an active central government, but uh, the 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 northern economy uh, was, a, you know, it was a, it was a creation of the war effort uh, more than more than anything. And and if it hadn't been, you know, the North would have forfeited its its primary advantage in terms of not just population, but but the, the material needed to to fight the war. And and of course, he saw, you know, he saw this this new the the robber barons, the the uh, you know the greedy uh, Wall Street. Uh, 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 you know, financiers. Uh, he saw them as as the arch enemies of the of the the southern people uh, who, as the as the country moved, uh, emerged from from Reconstruction. So um, he was, uh, you know, he he had. I don't think he had any real real complaint about about um, Abe Lincoln. Um, but he did. He did ultimately. Uh, you know, had, he he was a critic of the of the economic and the political establishment that had grown up as a result of the Civil War uh, and in the North. And uh, and so, yeah, he that that was kind of a test of his because you know he he believed in racial equality. And he certainly didn't believe in slavery slavery or any form of racial persecution. But by the same time, he did. He did empathize uh, at at a certain level with with the white Southerners uh, who were you know so you know cast out to the margins of American society. So he thought and and exploited and and persecuted. <laughs> so according to Woodward, uh, why and how did uh, Reconstruction fail to uh, live up to it, its objectives? Well, uh, that's another uh, point where Woodward's uh, uh, attachments to the to the South or to Southerners, uh, I think, comes into play because uh, he is ultimately, uh, and 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 mind you, here he's writing uh, in the nineteen sixties, principally about about this topic. Uh, he Woodward Woodward saw uh you know he he was he was uh um he was he, he put a lot of responsibility for the failure of reconstruction ultimately on on northern share the the passions of the small group of radical republicans who were determined to you know, restructure southern uh the, the southern racial system uh, uh you know thoroughly uh and, but see woodward is not uh, he is not. He's not privy to he's, the research that was done in you know subsequent generations by people like Eric Foner about the you know you know the violent resistance. Uh, yeah. So you can continue. Um, efforts efforts to uh, you know uh, kind of institu institutionalize black voting and office holding and. Uh, and you know, protect blacks from from marauding by by, by whites. Um, so uh, he he just didn't have the full uh, full picture uh, when he was he was he was saying it's really well you know the the you know the the North just uh, you know it it, uh, it uh, fudged on its commitment. To the you know to to southern the freed slaves. <laughs> so, um, was he uh, mistaken in his belief? Well, um, no, I think um, again, you know, he, Woodward was so so much of his work seems timeless uh, that you forget that that you know there was a finite amount of research that had been done at the time he was writing that. This and so he was not privy to the, uh, as said to the, you know, to the uh, uh, what would be discovered later uh, in terms of uh, the depth and the, the 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 vengefulness of of southern white resistance to uh, 
uh, to reconstruction, as well as the you know the the, the violent behind the actual overthrow of reconstruction governments in practically every southern state. So um you know he he was uh he was it, it was not accurate. I think you know it's fair to say that that the way he sketched things out and the amount of responsibility he put on uh, on people uh, living in the north for the failure of reconstruction was uh, you know was 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 out of sync with reality as it as it as it turned out uh, though he was not wrong about uh, you know about the the limited and rather tepid commitment of of you know the majority of of white northerners to the to the cause of the of the freedmen and of course there were you know they uh, the fifteenth amendment uh, you know, which mandated black voting uh, uh, in the South, uh, uh, you know, it didn't, it was not even uh, uh, ratified in some of the Northern states. And, and it, was a, it was a good while in, in some of the states that had fought for the Union before uh, black people were actually allowed, allowed to vote there. So, um, so he, he was not wrong in, in pointing to, you know, the, the, to the, there was a certain holier than thou kind of, aspect to uh, the criticism uh, launched toward the white Southerners, but, uh, but he was wrong, I think, in, uh, in ultimately what, you know, what were the true dynamics of Reconstruction uh, and, and particularly the end of Reconstruction. So what do, what are some of the common misunderstandings that Northern historians have about the South? Well, uh, I, uh, I think, uh, you know, again, I think, uh, the, uh, that's, a, that's something that has changed, uh, changed over time, um, uh, and, and, and for the better. Um, but, you know, there, there's this, uh, you know, one of the things that, um, uh, that, that Woodward, uh, I mean, you know, Woodward is sort of privy to this in a way, um, uh, the, the assumption by by northern historians for a long time was that that the, you know the the racial violence the persecution was essentially the work of the you know the lower class whites who um, you know who had uh, uh, you know were were in you know were were the present in such numbers that they you know they they couldn't be contained and uh, and. So they, you know, the, the, uh, the say the first generation of um, Northerners writing about Reconstruction were, were, uh, or, or, or the events right after Reconstruction were, were more sympathetic to, to you know, kind of the middle class whites who, whom they saw as sort of, you know, simply trying to manage this this savage mobs, uh, when of course, uh, you know, the more we we learned about. How segregation was made and how disfranchisement uh, came about. The more uh, you know, we we realized that it was uh, it was not the white masses who who after all had I mean they had numbers, but a lot a great many of them couldn't or didn't vote, and a great many of them were also stripped of the vote by the same measures that took the vote away from black people. Uh, so they didn't understand. Uh, the du duplicity uh, of uh, you know uh, uh, higher income, more affluent Southerners, more respectable uh, uh, Southerners uh, in uh, some of these uh, you know in in the, the you know the racial depredations uh, that uh, that that marked the South coming out of uh, coming out of uh, out of Reconstruction and. Uh, and the the reason why that's important is that uh, the, the the idea that it was uh, you know purely the southern white rabble who were doing all this um, made it, it 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 creates then the premise that uh, you know as soon as we can uh, you know educate these people and uh, and calm them down then the decent white folk will rise up. And and do away 
with with these institutions like this franchise and segregation. When when of course the you know the decent white folk were were heavily invested in uh, in both those things because they were the people who employed uh, uh, black labor and and didn't you know they didn't they didn't want the, the people who they were exploiting economically to uh, to have a uh, have a say so uh, you know in in the laws that were made and and you know and be able to secure protections for them. Uh, I mean, they were they were the ones who were really benefiting from the the Jim Crow system, uh, much more so than than the lower class whites, uh, which which Woodward saw as, I mean, he 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 you know he 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 had developed, I, I think, uh, you know, his he developed an empathy to the point not of of condoning you know, the lynch mobs or, or persecution or, or the racism or anything. But he, he did understand that this was in part a product of the manipulation of these emotions and anxieties by, uh, by whites farther up the socioeconomic uh, scale who, who used it to, uh, instead of, you know, allowing Southern whites to say, well, you know, the biggest problem I have is not with that, my black neighbor down the road. It's with that that guy who runs the sawmill. You know, who won't pay me a decent wage. Um, so they were perennially fostering, you know, rumors of a black uprising, or or pointing out the you know the threat that black men posed to to white women. Um, they were manipulating these, and 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 of course Woodward you know, Woodward understood this. Uh, 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 Particularly as as I think as his as his work on the South progressed. So tell me more about to what extent do the the Southern elite, so to speak, uh, see themselves as uh, benefiting from the Jim Crow status quo? Well, there were uh, you know the the the, uh, the economic aspect of uh, of Jim Crow is. Uh, you know, it's easy to lose sight of it. It's, it doesn't quite offer you the the drama and the you know the, the human confrontation uh, that that stories about you know black people being prohibited from riding on in railroad cars and and uh, entering you know public buildings and what have you. It doesn't it doesn't have quite that human drama, but it's really the explanation. In, in no small part for the Jim Crow system, because uh, with it came, as I was saying, you know, you you, uh, you control uh, black labor and some white labor by taking away the vote, and uh, you uh, you know you you prevent you 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 do your best to kind of stifle ambitions toward equality on other levels. Uh, with you know with 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 segregation uh, but it allows you to to basically pay you know pay little or nothing for black labor i mean you know, you, you, I mean, you have, it, it, it affords you uh, you know you're if they're not going to let if you're not going to let black people compete with whites economically that means that black people have to take what they can get in terms of employment and which for women meant work as domestics. Uh, for men, it, it meant you know, working, working in the sawmill or working in the in the cotton field, uh, uh, because they just didn't have the options that were open to whites, and it made a tremendous difference. One of the great myths, and this is a, this is another northern myth, was that you know they, they when they established this distinct school systems for blacks and whites. And, and these Northern experts would go on and on about how, how inefficient and wasteful this was to operate two school systems uh, when if they had just combined uh, them into one, you know, the, uh, they'd had more, more control, more central control, but, but also um, they would have been able to spread the resources, use the uh, resources more effectively for both races. But in the point of fact is the discrimination against black public education was so intense, so severe. Uh, uh, just take teachers' salaries, you know, they, that, uh, you know, if, if, if 
I, 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 somewhere along the way, I wrote about this, but uh, to my recollection, at some like 1937, if if the state of Georgia had decided to to uh, spend an equal amount of money on education for both races, it would have increased spending on education by nearly 50 percent. In other words, they were they were starving black education so severely that it was saving them a tremendous amount of money. Yeah, and and black people pay in taxes too if they had anything that could possibly be taxed. So, but they weren't getting you know their 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 share of return on the revenues that were tech, uh, collected from them. So um, it paid to discriminate. I mean, it, it basically, you know, you. Uh, you, you, if you, you know, if you were a, a white worker in a factory, you know, it, uh, it gave you a, a leg up on getting, moving up the ladder to become a foreman. If, if, if you're never going to have to worry about a black person, uh, you know, taking your job, uh, or, um, a black person certainly competing with you for a better job than you had. Um, so, um, the the the, the uh, Jim Crow was an enormously profitable system, and and it it, it certainly you know was energized by by racial uh, hatred and blindness and ignorance. There's no doubt of that. But it's it's it, functionally speaking, it you know it was a lot more than just whites taking out their frustrations and their hatred on blacks. Yeah, it was it was a conscious effort to exploit black people economically. I see. So, of course, um, that leads me to uh, Woodward's uh, most well-known work, um, The Strange Career of Jim Crow, which uh, was well regarded by people like Martin Luther King Jr. I believe he called it the Bible of the Civil Rights Movement. And I guess um, I do believe that he wrote that book with the intent of fighting against um, segregation, culminating in the 1954 Brown Supreme Court decision. So um, do, you, do you suppose that he, he wrote that book with that intent, or is it like merely a work of uh, historical research? No, I think he, he wrote that book, uh, you know, with very much the intent of furthering the cause of, of integration uh, by uh, by persuading people that that you know segregation was not you know the, the, the notion was widespread uh, you know among white southerners and 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 um, and and black northern and white northerners alike that segregation had been in place so long that it was just this impregnable practice of of you know of, uh, uh, that sociologists call the folk way you know just something that had developed in the course of the natural progression of, of a culture and that there was there was no no legal instrument uh no no power uh you know state or federal power that uh could really uh uproot or, or root out this, this this practice and and this is something that you know that liberal academics uh, uh swore by just as much as as, as conservative white southerners so in writing the strange career of Jim Crow, what he's doing is he's revising the whole history of how segregation came about, and and, and saying instead of having kind of evolved naturally out of slavery and been, you know, surviving over all those generations, that in fact segregation had been imposed primarily by law only at the end of the 19th century, meaning that. At the middle of the 20th century, when when he's writing the book, it, you know, uh, segregation in his mind was only about 50 years old. So, and and, and therefore, yeah, you know, because uh, because it was uh, uh, you know relatively uh, 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 you know segregation was a relatively new institution, and because it actually had not flowed out of the natural evolution of Southern society or culture, uh, but had been imposed by law. It should be uh, uh, vulnerable to being removed or dismantled 
by law, and which was was entirely contrary to what uh, to to what the kind of popular thinking, uh, um, even you know, regardless of whether you were a segregationist or an integrationist, the integrationists just thought this is we're we're really up against an insurmountable challenge in trying to get you know Southern whites to give up segregation. <laughs> and Woodward Woodward had worked with the legal team uh, who worked on on the case that led to the Brown desegregation decision. And while he worked for him, he he kind of was really withdrawn. He he didn't the uh, the case was supposed to you know they, they they called Woodward in because the justices had advised both sides uh, in the case to uh, consider you know whether or not the um, the framers of the 14th amendment which is what the, the, the litigation was grounded in uh, had intended for uh, public schools to be integrated or segregated and uh, Woodward doubted correctly I, I'm, I'm sure that that the, the framers of the 14th Amendment really had that in mind when they, they formulated the amendment. So he didn't want to get too much involved in the in the efforts of Thurgood Marshall and his legal team to make, uh, you know, to, to make the argument that that was the intent of the framers of the 14th Amendment. But what Woodward didn't understand was that uh, Thurgood Marshall had read the court so well and he knew that uh, the court was not looking for proof that 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 had been the intent of the framers, but merely enough evidence uh, to make it a plausible possibility that they did. And and so um, and that that, of course, is exactly what happened. The court, you know, the court, the, the non the, the uh, what the Brown legal team were really the real aim was to to come up with the question being in the evidence being inconclusive one way or another. Uh, and that when presented with this inconclusive uh, evidence, then the, the court turned away from history and went to, went, went all sociological, you know, on the impact, the effects of, of, uh, of segregation on, uh, on black children. And, but Woodward came out of that experience having held himself back all the more, I think, uh, you know, committed personally to doing what he could to further the cause of school integration and further the enforcement of the Brown decision. <laughs> and and the strange career of Jim Crow was was emblematic of that. So without diving too much into constitutional legal interpretation, um, why do you suppose that the uh, that I guess according to Woodward as well as the legal team behind Brown that the interpretation of the 14th Amendment, according to the Plessy case, uh, separated but equal, is mm -hmm. not what the framers intended, but rather the one that is uh, uh, in accordance with the Brown decision. Um, well, um, I think the, you know, the, the thing with the, um, the, the Brown, the Plessy decision in 1896 was, was basically grounded in this principle of, of, uh, you know, segregation being such a, a deeply embedded folk way that the courts would be powerless to do anything about it. And, um, and you know, at the end of the verdict, ultimately kind of rested on that, that as long as uh, that you met the, you know, you met the requirements of the 14th Amendment, as long as the, the accommodations provided for whites and blacks were equal and of course um everyone knew they were never going to be equal because by that time most black people couldn't in the south couldn't even vote who was going to listen to them when they said we need you know you need to tell the state regulators they need to to make make the railroads upgrade the quality of the of the cars that black people rode in i mean it wasn't going to happen so uh so when the you know when you come back in the in the, the legal team in brown what they are, uh, you know, they go back to the Fourteenth Amendment uh, and the uh, and the, uh, the separation of uh, 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 gosh, the, the uh, uh, equal protection of the laws 
and and argue that that you know that that the disadvantages the, of the blatantly discriminatory application of segregation in Southern public schools was a denial of equal protection under the law. And so they they went at it that way, you know, instead of saying that, you know, that, that they got away from the, the, the original Brown case was really, uh, uh, it was focused on the fact that uh, in these several locales, you know, Topeka and Clarendon County, South Carolina, the schools were, were grossly, you know, the, the, the resources for the schools for blacks and whites were grossly uh, uh, dis disparate, you know, and uh, so they were, they started out going at that to, in other words, they're trying to overturn Plessy. And then, uh, um, you know, Marshall starts talking to people and he, 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 he thinks that, it, you know, instead of just sort of saying, you know, we're going to make segregation more humane, we're going to make them live up finally to Plessy. Uh, why not just try to take down segregation altogether, which is what happened. <laughs> so I'd like to hear about uh, Woodward says uh, drift towards the right. Uh, allegedly, after the civil rights movement. Um, so I think there are two ways that one can switch political allegiances. One is that you adopt a new series of beliefs that run contrary to your old series of beliefs. And two, you find that your own side has grown so extreme that uh, you find yourself uh, being accommodated by the other side. So uh, which... Which of these was uh, Woodward's case in? Well, uh, Woodward was, you know, he was four square for for integration, um, and uh, I mean, and he he was overly invested in it uh, emotionally and intellectually as as basically a, the panacea for the American race problem. That, that if you got the, the races together and they came to understand each other and know each other um, and, and find cooperative endeavor. Uh, that you know, you 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 basically had the you know you're you're well on your way to solving the race problem. Uh, however, uh, um, uh, you know he and he had dedicated you know his own efforts and and uh, Woodward was I mean, he he went back in in terms of the the black leaders of the of the 20th century. I mean, you know, he, he, he was acquainted with a great many of them from you know John Hope in Atlanta. Uh, and and uh, you know the members of the NAACP, and and so he you know he he had great respect for what they were trying to do and push the cause of of racial integration, and then you know he had uh, basically put himself out there as a as a you know no holds barred advocate of 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 racial integration, and so what he saw happening in the second half of the nineteen sixties is when. You know, basically, the back of institutionalized Jim Crow has been broken. The uh, uh, he sees younger blacks moving up into the leadership ranks who are who are more interested in uh, asserting black autonomy and uh, you know, kind of carving out their own sphere and uh, uh, you know, asserting their own identity. Um, than in in simply joining as sort of junior partners with the white man, and uh, and he uh, he simply could not accept this because uh, he uh, because you know again he was still wedded to the principle that integration was was the you know the major step to be taken, but but also because he felt as though they had they were selling out you know the black leaders uh, you know who had. Put, had risked so much and, and uh, people who've been killed and, and, you know, and, and their white allies like him. Um, and, and, and uh, so he just couldn't, you know, he just couldn't accept it. And, and he, you know, he later would, he kind of grudgingly admitted that, that he should have under, you know, been more empathetic to the situation of, of black people who are coming out from under this long, period of subjugation and looking to sort of, you know, get some breathing space and, and assert their own, uh, uh, you know, identities and, and uh, uh, get, gain a certain autonomy for themselves. 
but he simply couldn't. Uh, he, he just couldn't accept that. And um, and and so um, ultimately, you know, he it, Woodward basically stood pat. You know, he, he, he basically was in, in 1968, he was right where he'd been in 1938 as far as, as racial integration. But of course, uh, by then, you know, the, the, the liberal uh, left had, had moved toward a, a more accommodating posture toward, toward the idea of, of black autonomy, black, you know, uh, separatism. And, um, and the expression of, of black cultural identity. And so uh, there was a real sense in which Woodward sort of stood still and the, you know, he, he where he was, it was like, uh, you know, the globe was behind him and the, you know, they changed the backdrop. Um, but uh, there, I will say this, and uh, I, I should have done a better job of this, but that is that because Woodward was older and frustrated and and you know he'd suffered a lot of personal losses by then he he was much more he was much more vengeful and uh, and mean-spirited in the way he expressed his opposition to to these uh, you know movements toward toward black economy uh autonomy uh, then he then I think he would have been at a younger age. So that adds to the sense, I think, that that you know he really did go over. You know, he went on, he he went all right wing. Uh, you know, in his in his last years, uh, but his position that that's another thing is his position. The position by standing where he did, he was he now found himself positioned alongside people who whom he would not have given the the type of people whom he would not have given the time of get, day twenty years earlier. Uh, you know the 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 the, the conservative element, uh, conservative academic element, and uh, and people like Dinesh D'Souza, you know, who you know, who are sort of like you know provocateurs uh, uh, aiming their you know slings and arrows at the at the left and uh, uh, at, at the cultural left as well. So um, it it gave him, I think, the appearance of having grown more conservative or more right wing uh, than he actually had. Uh, but but he was, you know, by the same token, he was he was definitely out of sync with uh, with the thinking on race of a younger generation of, of white liberals, not to mention, you know, uh, young, younger black people. Okay. Yeah, I, I did discover that one of uh, Woodward's pieces of writing, which is rather surprising, is his positive review on the Sousa's book uh, was that it's called Illiberal Education. Uh, he was taking aims at the you know, uh, purportedly uh, left-wing academic environment of that time. And um, I suppose it's uh, maybe both a matter of age as well as, uh, I guess, um, less sharpened judgment. Yes, I think it is. Um, and, and of course, De Sousa was was saying precisely you know, what we would want to believe. And and so he didn't, you know, he that's that's one thing he he reacted in uh, as he got older, he reacted in much more of a knee jerk fashion than you know, he had always been deliberate and thoughtful and very careful before he, he made a public statement or made his position known. And he ceased to be that way as he grew older. And so he didn't, uh, you know, he didn't bother. To, he had friends on these, as it turned out, he had friends on all these campuses that that the, the Susan was, you know, uh, attacking for their, you know, multiculturalism run them up. Uh, and uh, he could have, you know, before he he, he threw in with the Susan to the way he did, he, he could have done some checking with them, but he didn't. And uh, and so he put himself, you know, he he. Uh, it, you know, it would have been, I mean, it was embarrassing for Woodward as it was for a lesser, a person of lesser stature. It would have been, you know, it would have been oblivion uh, almost because, you know, he was, he had bought hook, line and sinker. Every exaggeration uh, 
uh, and all the hyperbole that that uh, the had had uh, had thrown out there. And so uh, he, you know, and that I mean that that did cost him. It didn't, you know, he's you know, he still maintained you know immense stature uh, to the end of his days. But but it it did uh, it, le- it left some people really disillusioned with Woodward. Uh, you yeah, know that 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 single review essay of D'Souza's book. So, final question: um, According to Woodward, um, is the historian's this responsibility primarily with the past or with the present? Well, I think he's. Uh, you know, Woodward might say I. W- I shouldn't presume to say what Woodward. Whatever he said, it'd be it, it would be better said than what I'll say, but. Uh, uh, I think he would he would he he would see the uh, historian's obligation as as uh, putting the past in conversation with the present, and uh, uh, so as to give you know perspective and uh, and give you some reason to uh, to think that uh, you know what you're you know maybe to question the things you're being told in the present whether whether you know whether history. Whether there is a history that that might suggest uh, skepticism about you know what you're being told, how things are being rationalized, and uh, and what have you, and uh, uh, he had a he had a remarkable gift for for seeing analogies and seeing these connections, and uh, uh, this is uh, as he was particularly as he was sort of you know coming out with a, a more expanded worldview, but. In the in 1953, he he taught. He spent the summer teaching at the University of Tokyo, and uh, and of course that's sort of you know Japan at that point is is sort of just coming out of a period comparable to Reconstruction in in the United States, and and he um, he perceives uh, the similarities that are, are you know kind of common themes he's he, emerge he sees emerge in in uh, in Japanese culture that uh, you know this this kind of search for you know attempt to kind of restore a, a historical golden age and and uh, you know he was really struck by the fascination of, of uh, Japanese people with gone with the wind uh, because the particularly the part about reconstruction because you know they 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 could relate to it so well so he was uh you know he was very good about about you know setting up these situations where he's just asking people to and showing people where they might find uh you know if 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 you're thinking about this consideration in the current context go back and look at it in the historical context and see what you might learn about what's going on right in your own day and uh, sometimes you know he went he kind of bent bent the past to make it so say things that it might not really have been saying or he he didn't have the evidence um to to back up anyway um but he was always thinking in terms of of getting people to question the present uh, uh, uh from a historical perspective well on that wonderful wonderful note thank you very much professor james cobb for joining this show Thank you. It was my pleasure.